chapter 9, please. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. And we're going to cover quite a bit of this chapter this morning and uh, move around just a little bit in the book of Daniel. And I'd like to preach to you this morning a sermon with this title, Daniel's Prayer Journal. Daniel's Prayer Journal. In Daniel 9 and verse 3, we'll begin by reading just part of this verse. It says, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication. It says he set his face unto the Lord God to seek him by prayer. So if you would, let's bow our heads and let's do a little bit of that now together. Let's pray and then we'll continue on. Father, thank you this morning that uh, we can sing together. We have an opportunity to give. Father, we have an opportunity now to set our faces towards you. Lord, we, we want to see you in all your glory. Father, teach us something about prayer this morning. Teach us how to pray, God. We need this lesson. Father, please speak to us, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Anytime you want to learn a new skill, I think it's always good advice to go and watch an expert do that particular job. If any of you would like to learn how to play the piano, just come sit up here while Hester is playing, because my goodness, that Tani can play. Man, she even gives that thing at the top, you know, with the, with the high notes, that's... that's that's fancy stuff there. That's, that's good playing. Um, I, I remember as Megan was learning how to play, I would sit there in the house, and we have piano at the house, and just watch her fingers move up and down those keys, just in amazement. And as soon as I sit down and touch those keys, it's like the piano hates me or something. <laughs> it just doesn't sound the same. But you watch an expert uh, do the job. I, I, I enjoy cooking, you know, and every now and then I'll put, put on one of those cooking shows and you get some of these professional chefs, you know, they start to chop those onions. And it's not like I do it, you know, chop, move, chop, move. You know, it might take me a couple minutes to get that onion done. Not these chefs, they're staring into the camera, telling a joke, laughing, Brrr, onion done. Now, if it, I value my fingers, <laughs> so, so I'm not going to move that fast, but I'm impressed. And you can learn a lot by, by watching any expert in a particular field and how to do it. And the same, I believe, is true when it comes to prayer. We get into the New Testament, and you can read there in the book of Luke, I believe it's chapter 11 and verse 1, where the disciples came to Jesus, and they said, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples to pray. Now, I don't know anybody that has prayer figured out, amen? All of us, and starting with me, need to learn something about prayer. And one of the best ways I've ever experienced learning about prayer is to be in the presence of someone who knows how to do it. That is the value of a prayer meeting. I, I'm all for closing the door to your prayer closet and praying to the Father in, in secret, in private. You need individual time with God. But there's also something to be said for listening and watching others as they pray. As we turn our attention to the book of Daniel... I think very few people, when they think of Daniel, it's not the first thing that comes to their mind to say he was a prayer warrior. We think of Daniel and he's this great interpreter of dreams. He, uh, he can understand and decipher hard sayings. Of course, he's an amazing prophet. I, he is prolific with his prophecies. We think of Daniel and we think of him standing up against the king's order to eat a certain kind of meat and drink that wine and how he resisted uh, even at his own peril. We think of, of Daniel and, and how he stood up to the king and read the handwriting on the wall. We think of him with the den of lions. Right? When Daniel comes to mind, those are the stories that we consider. Rarely do we say, do we, do we say look at Daniel, that great man of prayer. But as I begin to look deeper into the book of Daniel... I see it almost every time I turn around. There's Daniel spending time with God in prayer. So I'm going to take a look at this expert in prayer and try to share with you a few of the uh, things that stand out about his prayer life. Now, those of you that have done the discipleship course, I think you'll be familiar with this. There are four parts to prayer. You, you remember the four parts? There's worship, and then there's confession, 
There's request, asking God for, for various supplies. And uh, intercession actually falls under the category of request because intercession is when you're making requests on behalf of someone else. That's an intercession. And then there's thanksgiving. I want to show you those four parts in this man's prayer life. Look at verse number 3 again. Verse 3, I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Boy, I bet he took it seriously. He changed the way he dressed for a limited time. He couldn't even go with food. It it was so important to get a hold of God. And in verse 4, he says, I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession. We're going to talk about that more in a moment. And said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Notice what worship is. Remember what worship is. It is recognizing who God is. It is stepping into his presence. And where the Bible says God is light, you let that light penetrate beyond the surface, beyond your heart, deep into your soul, where it touches your spirit where it illuminates you and changes you. And now Daniel is pointing that out. O Lord, the great and dreadful God. He says in verse number 7, O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee. What's, What's Daniel doing? He's simply pointing out who God is. In verse number 9, you'll see it again. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgivenesses. He's just speaking about God's nature. I have found this to be very true, that when somebody spends time in the Bible, they get to know God better, it helps them in their time of worship. Because the more you spend time getting to know who God is, the more you desire to fall down in His presence in complete and utter awe and say, My God, how great Thou art. If you look in verse number 2, you'll see it. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books. Daniel had been reading about the Lord. He'd been reading about God's plan for the nation of Israel. In verse number 4, at the end of verse 4, he says, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him. Do you know where Daniel got that? That's written in Exodus. That's written in Deuteronomy. That's part of the Jewish Torah. He had been reading about God and how God works, the very nature of God. And this is what allowed Daniel to recognize God for who he is. A.W. Tozer said it like this. He said, you go to church once a week, nobody pays attention. You worship God seven days a week and you'll become strange. You know, there's a lot of truth to that. You know what Daniel did? It wasn't just a passing moment of prayer. It wasn't just saying the words that he had heard somebody else say. Daniel had recognized God from the Scripture because he'd been reading it. And he had also watched God work in his own life. Folks, do me a favor and think back in 2018. This is the last Sunday of this year. Think back to all the other Sundays. Think back to all the other days this year. What have you seen God do this year? Have you seen him work? Have you seen him answer prayers? Has he touched your heart? Has he changed you? Have you seen the glory of God in your life? Has his light broken through the darkness and shined onto you? If it has, friends, learn from Daniel. He's an expert in the area of prayer. Fall down before God and say, My God, how great thou art. What an amazing God we have. That's worship. That's worship. The second thing is confession. You can see it in verse number 9. He says, I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession. In verse number 5, he says, We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled. Why? By what standard does he count this? Even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Can I again link this to Daniel's reading and knowing the Bible? Because he knows what God expects, it's written in the Scriptures, he knows how far off the path they've gone. I wonder if we don't spend more time confessing our sins to God because we're not aware we're doing anything wrong. We're completely ignorant of how much we're offending Him. Did you know back in, the, in, the, in 2 Kings, Josiah, the, the Bible tells us that 
somebody, the, the priest Hilkiah, somebody had found the, the Bible, found the Old Testament scriptures, took them to the high priest, the high priest delivered it to the king, and the king, rip, he rent his garments, and he began to wail and, and cry out, say, God, I'm sorry. Why? It had come to his attention just how far he had strayed. Confession starts with you knowing what God expects. Verse number 8, if you'll look at the end of verse 8, he says, because we have sinned against thee. Verse number 9, to the Lord our God belong mercies and forgivenesses, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Daniel acknowledges he says, God, you, you sent your men to tell us what we were doing wrong. We didn't pay attention. It came out last night during the prayer meeting, actually. I found it interesting. It fits very nicely with the sermon that I'm now preaching. Think back to all the sermons you heard in 2018. How many of them have you put to use? How many of them have, sh have helped shape your life? It's impossible, and I get this, it's impossible to remember everything you've heard, and I get that. No one expects you to write a report and give us a, you know, a, a bulleted outline of everything you've heard. But week by week, as you hear something, you need to react to it, put it to use, and whether or not you can remember the exact words, let it shape your life. Daniel's apologizing to God, he says, because you've told us not for a year, but for a couple hundred years now, we should have known better. In verse 11, Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. People ask me all the time, how do we hear the voice of God? D do you see it now? He says, we departed, we didn't listen to your voice. Where was it found? In the written scriptures and in the oral message from the prophets. That's how you can hear his voice. He says in the middle of verse 11, Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. Not just what the prophet said, but what Moses wrote. Verse 12, And he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us, and against our judges that judged us, by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem. Daniel acknowledges that what Moses wrote almost a thousand years before this, God has confirmed it. God said, you depart from my law, here are the curses that I will bring. Here is what will happen to your nation. Everything that Moses wrote came exactly to pass. I challenge you later to go and read Deuteronomy 28. And you'll find as you read through that chapter, every single punishment God said would happen. It took a thousand years, but it all came to pass. Then I would challenge you to do this. Read in the Bible what God expects, not just from Israel, but from any nation under heaven, even South Africa. And then look around at the problems that South Africa has and see if you don't find it as confirmation that the God of heaven, the God of the Bible, our creator, he means what he says. And when we offend him, he deserves an apology, a heartfelt apology, a sincere ek is yamr. In verse 13, it says, As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us. Yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Verse 14 his confession continues, Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. How can God let all these bad things happen? He's watching upon the evil. He knows it's happening. Maybe we deserve it. It says in the middle of verse 14, For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth. For we obeyed not his voice. Daniel says the problems we're experiencing, it's not God's fault, it's our fault. We brought it on ourselves. In verse 15, he continues even further. And now, O Lord our God, thou hast brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and hast gotten thee renowned 
as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. He concludes in verse 16, he's going to go on, he continues to confess even into that portion of it. And he gets more into his request, which we'll look at in just a moment. But I'd like to ask you to make a, build a little bit of a bridge here, if we can. Daniel is making his confession, his apology, on behalf of the nation. Yes? He's saying, we, we, we have sinned, we have rebelled. Couldn't we do that as a nation here? Do you think that would be appropriate? I'm counting myself as one of you now. I've been here long enough that uh, I, I can shoulder some of the blame for what's going on. I, I think it would be appropriate for South Africa collectively to fall to their knees and raise their hands to heaven and say, God, we're sorry. We've turned our backs on you. All cultures, all languages, skin color doesn't matter. We've offended God. Now, I think that's true as a nation. But my goal is not so much to get S.A. to turn, right? As much as it is today to get you to turn. Because we're not going to get South Africa to turn if we don't start with the individuals. A nation is made of cities. Cities are made of families. Families are made of individuals. So if we can get you to fall to your knees and say, God, it's been a while since I have sincerely apologized for how I've treated you. But I am sorry. When you think about it, the greatest men in the Bible were all experts at this. You know what David said? Psalm 51, against thee and thee only have I sinned and have done this evil in thy sight. He repented, he confessed it. Peter said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. That's before he denied the Lord three times. This was early on in the ministry. Peter knew how to repent. Paul said, O oh, wretched man that I am. He said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He was aware of his sinful nature and how it affected God. You know what I found? Not only in your lives, but in mine. I, I know this to be true because I'm a bit of an expert at this piece of pathetic nature of mine. When somebody gives me a piece of criticism, somebody says something negative about me, I don't care how true it is, it really hurts me deeply. I really take it personally. I get so offended. You might be wrong. I may be nothing like you think. I might be even worse than you think. <laughs> Am I reading your mind? <laughs> but you know what we tend to do? We hear the whispers. We listen to the gossip. And man, that really touches us, yes? It breaks our heart to hear that other people don't like us. And then when God clearly says, I don't like what you're doing. You are not living and acting and thinking and feeling in a way that I deem appropriate. When God clearly says, I don't approve of how you are, you know what we do? We blow it off. We say, well, that's just your interpretation. Ah, don't be judgmental. And then we, we, we do everything to get around that. But God said exactly in the Bible that you need to change. When Jesus showed up, the first thing he said was repent, and yet we turn a deaf ear to that. How is it that when God gives us constructive criticism in the form of rebuke, we find a way around it? But when then some uamurtani, some friend, some co-worker, some stranger on the road says something ugly, we let it bother us for the next four or five months. Why is it that God's opinion doesn't penetrate a little deeper? Could it be... Could it be that the problems you're experiencing in your life, they're your fault? David, um, uh, Daniel, I'm sorry, he had just experienced 70 years of captivity. 70 long years living in a foreign land where he wasn't welcomed. He wasn't appreciated. His people weren't treated right. And as he's praying, he's saying, God, if we're going to get the land fixed... If we're going to fix the country, it's going to start with us acknowledging what we've done wrong. We're to blame. I wonder if you can look at the problems in your life and say, now where have I gone wrong? 
could this be an indication that something's not right between me and God? The next thing, we've looked at worship, we've looked at confession. I'd like to point out the request. The request, and this is simply you asking God to do something, to supply something. It's not wrong. It's not wrong to ask God to provide. What's wrong is if that's the only thing you ever do when you pray. And I think we're all pretty, uh, pretty well expert when it comes to God I need, God help me, God do this, God do that. We tend to ignore the other parts of prayer, but there's nothing wrong with this part. Daniel, as you can see in, in verse number 2, he had been reading the prophet Jeremiah. You can see in the middle there of verse 2, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Daniel had been reading what Jeremiah wrote. And he said, he got to Jeremiah chapter 25 where it was written that Israel would be in captivity for 70 years. Daniel, this is now 70 years later. So he's reading this saying, well, we're right on schedule. This is the time that I can ask for God to restore us because the prophecy has been fulfilled. So verse 16, here's the request. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, I, I beg you, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. He says, Lord, we're a bad testimony. We are an embarrassment. The rest of the world looks at us. We're supposed to be God's people. We're acting nothing like it. He says, now God, I've been reading the prophet Jeremiah, and as I understand it, your wrath is over, and now it's time for the mercy. So verse 17, Now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications. When you supplicate, you are asking, you're praying, but you're doing it earnestly. You're begging, that's why the beseech is in there. Uh, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O oh my God, incline thine ear and hear, open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies. You, do you hear the, humble, the humility in the request? God, we don't deserve it. We're not asking you to give us something that we deserve. We're asking you simply because you're a merciful God. Please look on our situation. Honor your word. Do this for your sake, not for ours. Change our situation so that other people can see it and say, praise God, look what he did in your life. In verse 19, he says, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not, it means don't wait. Defer not for thine own sake. O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. Have you ever heard somebody pray? And I think all of us do this to an extent. We, we, we repeat the name of God many times. Now, Father, I'm asking you about this. And Lord, I want to ask this. And Father, this. And Lord, this. And every sentence starts with Father, Lord, oh my God. Do you hear Daniel doing that? Oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord, oh my God. That's how we pray when we're desperate. Whenever there's a sense of grief, it starts with, oh. You can see it all through his prayer. Verse 7, oh Lord. Even in verse 4, oh Lord. Verse 8, oh Lord. Verse 15, oh Lord our God. Verse 16, oh Lord. Verse 18, oh my God. This is real desperate prayer. And he's making the request saying, God, please have mercy on us. Please fix the situation. But don't do it just so, listen. Don't do it just so that we can be more comfortable. Do it so that we can become trophies of your grace. Do it so that the other people around us can see the glory of God shining in our life. Here's what we do. God, please fix the land. Please, God, help our government to make good decisions. Please, God, protect us. Why? Because I don't want to be uncomfortable. Because I don't want to lose any of my possessions. Is it wrong to pray and ask God to provide your daily needs? No, Jesus said, when you pray, give us this day our daily bread. You're allowed to pray that. But what about this verse? 
What about when Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Why is it we flip that around almost every time and we put the things first and the kingdom of God, we'll, we'll find that when we, when we need it. That becomes a secondary concern. I've had people ask this before and it's a legitimate prayer. How can we see more prayers answered? Do this. Read your Bible. Find out what things God is interested in. And then ask for those things. <laughs> I have never seen God fail to answer one particular prayer of mine. I even saw it happen yesterday. I had a coffee scheduled with one of the members. Because of the weather, I had called off the, the church-wide witnessing. And I prayed, I said, God, I was looking forward to giving somebody the gospel today. Please, as I go out to have this coffee, would you give me a chance to share the gospel with somebody? Did you know God's interested in that prayer? God's very interested in someone else hearing the gospel. I sat down with this church member, we're having a lecker we're going through this and that, and I pulled out a Bible and I begin to read a verse to this person, and foom, the waitress comes over and says, oh, I'm very interested. And I take out a gospel track and I get to give her the entire gospel, and she says, no, no, I'd like to come to your church. And I said, praise God, isn't this wonderful? You want to see prayers answered? Find out what God's interested in. Find out what's going to give Him glory and then concentrate on those things rather than yourself. You see, Daniel wanted God to fix the land, not for the Israelites, but for God. So that the glory of God should shine throughout Israel and all the world. Why do we want God to fix South Africa? Why do you want God to fix your home? Why do you want God to fix your business? Is it just for you? Or does the glory of God come into that at all? James chapter 4 says, Ye ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you might consume it upon your own lust. James said, The reason you're not seeing God answer many prayers is because your prayers are all about you. Your requests circle around your lusts, not God's glory. Jesus said, Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, listen, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Think back to what you've been asking God to do. How many of those things would glorify God? How many of them would just glorify you? The, th the fourth thing we want to talk about, we've covered worship. Recognize God for who He is. Confession. You know what that is? Recognize you for who you are. Third, you can make requests, but make sure that your requests circle around the glory of God. Fourthly, I want to focus in on thanksgiving. And, and again, this part often gets overlooked because we're so worried about the request that if God happens to answer it, we tend to overlook that He just did it and we move on to the next request. Flip your Bible back a couple chapters. Come to chapter 2, please, verse 23. Daniel 2 and verse 23. I'm fairly certain you're familiar with what happened in Daniel 2. The king Nebuchadnezzar has had a dream and now he's demanding that his wise men and magicians and sorcerers tell him the dream and the interpretation. If they can't, then Nebuchadnezzar says you're all going to die. Well, Daniel, just because of the way this corrupt government was set up, he was part of this wise men group. He didn't, he didn't want to be known and associate with one of them, but... Uh, he kind of got forced into that position. So now Daniel's life is in peril. And when the, when the guards come to take Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel says, what's going on, guys? Why, why are we in danger? They said, no, no, the king said you got to die. Why? What did we do? Well, the king had a dream, and he wants you guys to tell him what the dream was and what it meant. You see, Nebuchadnezzar had forgotten what he dreamed. So these guys had to tell him the dream and the interpretation. Have you ever done that? Have you ever woken up the next day? For, you know you had a dream, but you can't remember what it was. You woke up scared or excited or whatever. You're like, man, what was that? That's what Nebuchadnezzar did. He had too much pizza the night before. He woke up the next day and said, what was that? And, and, and to be honest with you, the request he's making actually happened like two years after the dream. And we don't have time this morning to get into how you know that, but... Nebuchadnezzar just dawned on him, he had this dream, and now he wants to know. 
Daniel says to the guard, please give us a little time. Verse 14, 15, down, on down to 18. Let me go pray about it. You know what he did? He said, I'm not going to pray alone. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, please come on over to my house. We need to have a serious prayer meeting. We need to ask something quite big of God. Here's the issue. Laid it out. They prayed about it. You know what God did? God showed up and answered that prayer. He showed Daniel what the dream was and what it meant. So verses 19, 20, 21, 22. Daniel is worshiping God. Before he gets to the thanksgiving, he's just saying, God, you are so great. No other God could do what you just did. And then in verse 23. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hast given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto me now what we desired of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Daniel is quick to thank God for what he just did. Why? Because when you thank someone for what they've done, it shows that you not only appreciate what they did, but you appreciate that person. If you think nothing or even little of the person that did it, you might like what they gave you, but because you have no respect for who they are, you don't mind just walking off and not thanking them. What does it say when God takes care of us on a daily basis and we never even pause to say, thank you, God, for thinking about me? Thank you, God, that you bowed down and inclined your ear towards me and actually listened and took interest in my life and you thought about my needs. You looked at what I needed. And when I asked, you provided. God, thank you for this. If you have any respect for him, you have to be quick to give him a genuine thank you. And listen, a genuine thank you can go a long way. It doesn't have to be a long thank you. You don't have to be eloquent. Some of the best thank yous I've ever had, somebody comes up with a tear in their eye and throws their arms around me and says, I don't know what else to say, but thank you. When's the last time you threw your arms around the feet of Jesus Christ bowing at the throne of grace and said, Oh God, thank you. Thank you for saving a poor wretched sinner like me. Thank you, God, for providing for me, for watching over me, for counting the hairs of my head, for knowing my name, for being interested in me, God. I don't understand why, but I sure do appreciate it. I've had people ask this as well. They say, you know, preacher, I, I struggle to pray for a long time. I can pray for five, ten minutes, but then I don't really know what else to say. I'm going to venture a guess that all you're doing is making requests. And after five or ten minutes, that's about all you need. <laughs> There's only so much you can ask for. If, if you're having a bad day, it might go 15 minutes. <laughs> now, how about you spend some time thanking God for what he's done? I promise you, you'll be there longer than 15 minutes. Take your Bible, flip to Daniel chapter 6. Let me show you something else about being thankful. Daniel 6, and this is where the government has signed into law a corrupt, well, let's say they signed, they, they put into legislation a corrupt law that stole Daniel's right to pray. And they said, if any man prays for the next 30 days, they'll die. I wonder if South Africa were to pass that law, what that would do for our prayer lives. That, I'm sure, would thin out the herd. You talk about separating the sheep from the goats. We'd know then who's serious about it. Daniel, this is why I consider him an expert on prayer. Chapter 6 and verse 10, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled down upon his knees three times a day and prayed, and look at this, and gave thanks before his God, as he did aforetime. If I'm Daniel, if, if I'm the main character of this story, I don't even know if I'm going to go into my house and pray, right? 
But if I do go into the house and pray, I open the windows, I look towards Jerusalem because that's where a Jew would find the presence of God. God had promised to present himself in the temple there. So Daniel knows to pray that direction. And I don't know if I would be on my knees saying, God, thank you. Not at this point. I might be on my knees begging God, please get a hold of the government, let them change this horrible law. I don't know if I would be as spiritually mature as Daniel to get down and say, God, this is a really bad day. And they, I'm probably going to die. This might be my swan song. This might be the last time you hear from me, God, on this side of eternity. I might be up there with you in a minute. But God, all the same, thank you. When it comes to thanking God, not just when things are going well, but the Bible says this is the will of God in Christ Jesus, to thank Him always. To thank, to, in everything the Bible says, give thanks. Now, I want to, th these are the four major parts to prayer, right? Worship, confession, request, thanksgiving. You can see that Daniel covered them all. He's an expert at prayer. There are three other I don't want to say side issues because they're, they're important things, but there are three extra little lessons I believe we can learn from Daniel. And much of this we've already seen, so you don't need to go back and look at the Scriptures again. But in chapter 2, you remember what Daniel asked. Please show me what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed two years ago. Guys, that's a big request. I, I, I know it's important when you get in your car and say, God, please get me home safely. That's a legitimate prayer request, but I don't know if we'd count that as big as show me what so-and-so dreamed two years ago so that I don't die. <laughs> Here's the first extra lesson I think we learned from Daniel's prayer journal, and that is when you pray, don't forget to ask big. Ask big. When's the last time you asked God for something big? Not for yourself. Listen, God is not Father Christmas. We're not saying, you, you know, you send the letter to God and here's what I want for my birthday. <laughs> When's the last time you looked into the scriptures and you said, okay, this is what would glorify God. Now, God, please do this so that everybody knows it was you that did it. When's the last time you asked something big? James said it like this in chapter, James chapter 4. He said, you have not because you ask not. You have not because you ask not. It's, it, it, it hit me this week. I even posted it on, on, on Twitter. Can you believe it? I'm on Twitter. That's exciting stuff. I posted it on Twitter. You're as close to God as you want to be. You're as close to God as you want to be. How much do you want to see God work in your life? What, what do you want to see Him do? How big do you want to dream? You say, I don't think God can use me much. Well, that's because you're looking at what you can do. How about you ask God for something big? William Carey said it like this, Expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. He said that in the late 1700s when no one was into mission work. No one. He said that in church and the people laughed at him. They scoffed at him and for two months no one paid any attention to him. William Carey kept on praying for it. God, please let us reach the heathen. Let us take the gospel to the uttermost part of the earth. It is our responsibility to go. He kept praying for something big. You know what happened? Just a few years later, he was on the boat going to India. He spent over 40 years in that country with ne never took a break. He translated the Bible into six different languages and several different dialects. He started the Baptist Missionary Society that to this day is reaching over 40 countries. And if you go to India, you'll see William Carey's face all over that country to this day. Why? He expected something great from God and he prayed like it. He prayed as if he had a big God. If we were to look at your prayer life, how big of a God would we assume you have? How big is the God that you pray to? I'll tell you another smaller lesson or maybe extra lesson we learned from Daniel's prayer journal and that is in chapter 6 and verse 10 what we just saw here. He makes time and room for prayer. He makes time and room for it. When they signed that law 
into existence. It says he went to his chamber, opened the windows, and he prayed three times a day. That tells me that he has a special place where he prays and a special time when he does it. How about you? Do you have a time and a place where you meet with God? Do you have a cool of the garden where you walk and talk with the Lord? From day one, right? The Bible tells us in Genesis 3 that the Lord would show up in the garden in the cool of the day. Today, guys, we have no excuse, right? The whole day is cool. (laughs) The whole day is cool. You can walk and talk with Him all day today. Do you have a time and a place where you meet with God? Sir, ma'am, do your children ever see you retreat to the prayer closet? Do they know that when mom or dad locks that door that we shouldn't disturb because they're in there having the most important conversation of the day? I wonder if you have that special place with God. Somebody sent me a picture just, I think it was this week, maybe last. They sent me a picture of a prayer bench that they'd made. Over these holidays, this person took his time to make his own prayer bench. You know what that tells me? He has an intention to do something with that. I seriously doubt anybody would make a prayer bench to decorate his house with it. It would start some conversations though, wouldn't it? I'm sure some people would walk in the house and say, what is that? (laughs) They'd never seen one. This man made that prayer bench not, not to be seen, not to show it off. He has an ongoing, standing time in his schedule where he's going to meet with God. How about you? How about you? Is God simply something you do that is praying? Is that something you do when it's convenient? Or do you make the time for it? Would you uh, look at your schedule today? I I got one. I I keep my calendar on my phone. I got things for the next two weeks. I wonder, I wonder if you would, if you're, because I know several of you have a very busy schedule. Work is about to come, you know, start back, all the businesses and shops will open, and your schedule is about to be so filled up. How about you pencil in some time with God? Make it a part of the schedule. And when somebody else calls and wants that time, say, no, I'm sorry, that's booked. I have a very important meeting. I, I do this at the house, I tell them, Listen, if, if the, the door to my office is closed, you're welcome to knock, but if you don't hear me answer, please assume that I'm having a meeting. Even though no one else physically is in the room. Why is it? Why is it that when we go to pray, if the phone rings, we answer it? If something else distracts us, we go to that. Why not say, no, I'm sorry, everything else has to wait. I'm taking time with God. I've, I've made some time. I've made a special place. i got a friend in America, Brother Joe Costa, He's the pastor that actually ordained me into the ministry. Joe Costa is a bona fide Yankee. Now, I know for, you guys think all Americans are Yankees. I am not a Yankee. Did you know that? I'm not a Yankee. Maybe by your standard, but not by mine. I am the exact opposite of a Yankee. I am a Texan. Proud of it. But a Yankee is somebody from the northern part of America. And especially when, when you go to New York itself, those guys are the real Yankees. Now, Brother Costa, he grew up in New York City. He worked in Manhattan for years. He pastors now on Long Island. And he is the Yankee of Yankees. And anytime we get together, boy, he can just... I love to listen to him talk. Hey, Brother Mike, yeah, forget about it. Let's sit down and talk about the Bible. Well, I, mean, I could listen to that accent for hours. It's just fun to listen to. And every time I pass by New York, Brother Costa, he says, Hey, Brother Mike, sit down. Yeah, forget about it. Every sentence has forget about it in it. I don't even know what I'm forgetting about. Yeah, forget about it. Forget about what? What is it? I don't know what that means. I kid you not, when you drive into Brooklyn, (laughs) when I was there, there's a billboard as you come into Brooklyn that says, Forget about it. (laughs) I kid you not. It's Christian. Welcome to New York. Forget about it." (laughs) it. It's It's the equivalent of your... Uh, lecker or shame because you guys use those words in every situation they forget about it in everything we sit down him and I the first time we met we were up from nine o'clock at night till four in the morning talking about the Bible it was just thrilling the next time I went through New York this was now I don't know six seven months later we were up till two in the morning talking about the Bible 
We talk about God. We talk to God. We talk about the Bible. It was just wonderful. But here's the thing. I really look forward to those times with Brother Costin. It's so special to sit in his office or at his dinner table and have these conversations. But I only have had about four of them because I don't get to pass by New York that often. And here's the shame. Here, here, here's the, the sadness of this. Some of you have that same relationship with God. It's really good when you get around to it, but it doesn't happen very often. You don't make time to go out of your way to sit and let the time just escape you and forget about everything else and just spend time with God. Make some time for it. And lastly, if you come to chapter 10, Daniel chapter 10, ask big, not for yourself, but for God's glory. Make time, make room for Him even when it's not convenient. I don't think it was convenient for Daniel, was it? When he made room and time wasn't convenient, he ended up in the den of lions. <laughs> but he did it anyway. And then the last thing I believe we can learn from Daniel's prayer journal, chapter 10 and verse 2, in those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hiddekel, when then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with the fine gold of Uphaz. And the next several verses explains how either an angel or, some people say it was a pre- incarnate appearance of Jesus whichever it was a, he had a heavenly meeting somebody had been d sent down from God to meet with Daniel now it took him three weeks for this to happen for three weeks he didn't eat anything nice or lecker he had just enough to keep him going but for three weeks he was praying and waiting on God and that's the lesson some of us we go into the prayer closet and we expect all the magic to happen right away we walk in the prayer closet, shut the door, and say, Oh God, now here I am. Brother Mike just preached a sermon on praying, so here it goes. I'm going to give it a shot. God, hello, hello. Now, it could be that the cell service isn't working so well. <laughs> Maybe there's some static on the line. But we don't hear him right away, so we assume maybe we got the wrong number. Maybe I don't know how to pray. This, it's not getting through. I'm not seeing God do anything. How long would you persevere if you didn't hear from God? H have you ever tried to call somebody and the call won't go through? So you try it again. And you try it again. You try, how, how many times do you keep trying? Eh, seven or eight. It depends on where you're at, right? Because if you're in the middle of nowhere, you might give up quicker because you know there's no cell service. But sometimes you think, well, the lines are just busy and you keep trying. Yes? How many times do you keep trying? Seven, eight, maybe ten. If it's really important, 30, 40, three weeks. Now that's long by, even by South African standards, right? <laughs> Could you imagine somebody trying to put the call through for three weeks? Daniel tried to put the call through for three weeks. Finally it went through. Daniel, what can you teach us about prayer? Well, worship, confession, make your request, make sure you thank God, ask something big, make room, make time, and listen, seek God until you find Him. Seek the Lord, seek His strength, seek His face forevermore. Folks, if He says, seek Him, he didn't say, you'll immediately find me. He did say, if you seek for me with all your heart, you will find me. But he didn't say it will happen immediately. When I call Brother Donovan, I think most of you will remember him, the, my pastor from America. He came and preached for us a few months ago. I, I rarely call him because he is, and I, I'm, I just have to admit it, he's the most awkward man to talk with. He's so difficult to have a conversation with. 
even when you're sitting there in person, you can ask them a question. Say, so, uh, Brother Donovan, how you doing? Fine. And he won't say anything else. Say, ah, brother, glad, glad to hear you're doing well. Now, if I say that to you, it's your turn to say something to me, right? That's how a conversation works. Not in his world. So I'm glad the family's good, church is good, yeah? And he doesn't say anything. Now what's worse is when you call him long distance, you know there's a bit of a time delay on the phones. So, so when I ask him a question and he doesn't answer, I don't know, is this the time delay? Or did, did he not understand the question? Or is, does he just not want to answer it? Oh man, the last phone call I had with him, I, I asked him something, I said, how's your family, how's the church? So yeah, my, my daughter's getting married, because it was just before Megan was going to get married. And I said, yeah, my daughter's getting married. Yeah, thank God, he's a great guy that she's going to marry. Praise God for that. Nothing. I thought, did I say something wrong? Is he not excited that my daughter's found a good man? What did I, what did I do? It was so awkward. I, I sat there. Now listen, five seconds of silence on the phone is a long time. That's, a, that's an eternity on a phone call. And I sat there for about five seconds giving him a chance to respond and then nothing. I said, well, brother, it's been good talking to you. I, I don't know why I lied. Because <laughs> that, that wasn't true. I didn't enjoy that conversation at all. I said, well, brother, it's been good talking to you. He said, yeah, you too, brother. <laughs> He didn't, he's not South African. He didn't even say bye. The phone just clicked, done. That's how we do it in America. You guys, bye, 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 just hit the, hit the end button. <laughs> not in America. Yeah, good talking. <laughs> you don't even get the rest of the sentence out. Now, I, I don't like talking to Brother Donovan on the phone because of how awkward that can be. The long pauses, the lack of response. But I will continue to call him. You know why? Greatly respect him. Sometimes I need his help and advice. And I want to have a relationship with him. But what far surpasses my relationship with my pastor is my relationship with my Savior. And even though there might be some pauses where I say something and I don't hear anything back right away. And, and maybe I have to wait a week or two before I get the response. I'm not going to stop seeking him. Wait on God. Wait on the Lord. Folks, Daniel has given us his prayer journal. There are so many interesting things in the book of Daniel, so many prophecies, interpretations. He, he overcame the lions, but let us not forget to learn from this expert on prayer. Let's all stand, if you would, please. Let's have our heads bowed and eyes closed. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Folks, how about you start right now? Caleb's going to play something quietly. How about you make time and make room right now? Listen, during this time, that, that's why I ask for heads bowed and eyes closed is, is to give everybody that moment of privacy so that they can react as they see fit have you felt God grip a hold of your heart this morning and say I'd like to hear from you more that should be a very humbling thought that God wants to hear from you more than you want to hear from him how about you start right now make some space right where you're at we got plenty of space up here in the front come and pray take a couple minutes right now say God please help me this year I want to spend some time in my prayer closet speaking to my father which is in secret
For three weeks, Daniel prayed. You know what happened when that heavenly being came down? He said, Daniel, we've heard you the whole time. We had some other spiritual things we, we were taken care of, but we've heard every word. He said, Brother Mike, I feel like I'm wasting my time. I feel like I'm spinning my wheels. I'm praying, but I'm not getting any response. It's just awkward. Heaven hears every word. Persevere. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. I want to see God help us put up a church building. That's a big thing. I believe God can do it. And I want to do it for His glory, not for us. Not for us. We're not worth it, but He is. You know why we want to do that? So we can have a stable place to send the gospel all over the world. We want to send it to Russia and India, Malawi and Mozambique and Brazil and Moldova. And we want to send it everywhere. That's a big thing to ask. From this little church, how can we do that? We can't. But we can talk to a God who can. Father, thank you this morning for speaking to our hearts. God, there, there will never be a time when any of us can say that we have prayer figured out. Lord, my prayer remains, teach us to pray. Thank you, thank you God for coming down in the cool of the day to fellowship with us. Thank you for the sweetness of your presence. Thank you God for speaking to our hearts. Oh, what a privilege it is to hear your voice. God, please teach us to pray. Father, we still have more that we'd like to learn today. Please bring us back tonight. We'd like to hear from you again. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.